Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jonathan Murray, <coughs> Deputy Director of the Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership, and I'm happy to welcome you to another in the series of Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership Technology Bytes webinars. The Technology Bytes series of webinars aim to raise awareness of emerging capabilities in the UK low carbon automotive supply chain by providing a platform for low carbon vehicle partnership members to promote their technology, product or service to the wider stakeholder community interested in low carbon vehicles and fuels. In this edition of the Technology Bytes, we will feature two of LOCVP's active members, Diamond Engine Company Limited and Pi Innovo. Diamond Engine Company owns a cutting-edge novel zero-emission engine technology that runs on liquid air or nitrogen. The engine can be used as a very high-yield heat energy recovery system or as a standalone zero-emission solution. I'm pleased to say we have Michael Ayres, Demon Engine Company's Chief Operating Officer, to present their novel zero-emission engine technology. <laughs> Our second feature company is Pi Innovo. Pi Innovo are experts in the design and development of innovative electronic systems to the automotive, transportation, defense, industrial and aviation industries. Joining us today from Pi Innovo is David Price, who is their Chief Technical Officer. Good afternoon to both of you. But before we start, I'd like to cover a few ground rules. We'll be, we will be allowing time for question and answers at the end of each presentation. You can post a question at any time during the webinar via the control panel on the right hand side of your screen or during the Q&A session. Alternatively, during the Q&A session you can electronically raise your hand. I'll then invite you to ask your question to the speakers. If you're using a telephone to participate, please ensure that you enter your audio PIN so that you can join the debate. Your audio PIN is displayed on the control panel and you need to punch it into your phone number pad with a hash sign before and after the audio PIN number. If you don't do this, we won't be able to hear you, but you will still be able to submit questions electronically. If you have any problems, post a question through the chat box on the control panel and we'll do our best to help you. We will also be recording the webinar and it will be available for download from the LOCVP website from tomorrow. For those of you who are new to LOCVP, we are a not-for-profit membership organization comprising of around 200 organizations which have joined forces to, to take forward a mission. That mission is to accelerate the shift to low carbon vehicles and fuels and to ensure that UK PLC benefits from that shift. Our members cover all sectors involved in road transport, including government at national, regional and local levels, vehicle manufacturers, fuel suppliers, fleet operators, financial institutions, environmental NGOs, research institutions and technology-led startup companies. But now we move on to our presentations. Firstly, uh, we turn to Michael Ayres, Diamond Engine Company their Chief Operating Officer, to present their novel Zero Emission Technology. So Michael, let me, I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So as Jonathan suggested, I'm going to talk to you today about our, the Diamond Engine Company and our technology that runs by vaporizing liquid nitrogen or liquid air to produce high pressure gas that can do work. Uh, I thought I'd start by giving an idea of um, who's involved in our research consortium, that our technical function is pretty much outsourced entirely to Ricardo UK and that they're supported by a group of UK based universities who provide predominantly an advisory service. On the commercial side that we have support from Ricardo, BDO, who are professional services firm and sustainability experts, along with the consultancies E4 Tech and Productive. I thought it would be helpful to tell you a bit about um, liquid nitrogen and how that it's made before we start. So essentially it's made by refrigerating ambient air until it turns into a liquid and then separating it from the other components of air like oxygen and argon. About 700 litres of ambient nitrogen becomes one litre of liquid nitrogen. 
This process is, acts, is pro, takes place in the UK at relatively large scales, 300 to 1,000 ton a day units, not uncommon, and all you need to do it are electricity and air. The liquefaction plants already turn on and off in response to instructions from the national grid, and bulk storage is extremely cheap. Many of the plants operating in the UK today have two to three days storage capacity on site. So that's particularly important if in the future you want to integrate production with renewables. There's mature distribution infrastructure in just about every industrialized country on Earth. And also, at the moment, the liquid nitrogen is the essentially almost a waste product. And so we'd envisage early deployment of the technology using liquid nitrogen. In the longer term, there's some reasons why we may want to use liquid air as the energy vector. At this stage, I draw your attention to some work that the Institute of Mechanical Engineers is doing to look at the use of liquid air in general, both grid scale and for transport applications as an energy vector. You can find out more about that at liquidair.org.uk. To give you an idea of the operating principle of the Diemen engine, it essentially exploits the fact that one litre of liquid nitrogen expands about 700 times in the heat adductor ambient temperature. What's novel about the Diemen engine is that this process takes place inside the cylinder of the engine. This is enabled by the use of a heat exchange fluid, which is put onto the top of the piston just before top dead center. The liquid nitrogen is then injected directly into the heat exchange fluid, causing it to boil extremely rapidly and expand, which obviously pushes the piston down inside the cylinder. And you have this entrained heat exchange fluid, which at the moment is a mixture of water and antifreeze, that gives up heat during the expansion process to give you a very efficient expansion. The bottom dead center, the exhaust valve opens, and the mix of nitrogen gas and entrained heat exchange fluid is expelled from the cylinder. You can then reclaim the heat exchange fluid from the exhaust system and reheat it and reuse it, and the nitrogen gas is expelled to environment. One of the advantages of this process is you eliminate expensive and heavy high-pressure heat exchange exchanges, which makes it feasible for transport applications. In terms of the work done to date, that this started as a typical garage invention that a gentleman called Peter Beerman started off by modifying his Vauxhall Nova and driving it around the streets of Bishop Stortford. After he'd achieved this, um, we decided that a certain amount of due diligence was required to move forward. And so the University of Leeds took a look at the thermodynamics of the system, concluding that, yes, the system looked viable and it would work. That was then followed by a four-year PhD at the University of Queen Mary that involved testing proof of concept engines, looking at the injection phenomena, and some more thermodynamic analysis. When that completed in October of last year, then we contracted Ricardo to do a period of due diligence that concluded in January of this year. So their due diligence concluded that the development work done to date was rigorous and well done, and that they believed that their test engine could be delivered within a relatively short period of time. And finally, they believe that there would be applications for this technology. So their findings were then reviews, reviewed with our advisory panel of academics from the various universities who endorsed and supported their findings. At the moment, that we have a clear development program to move the technology from TRL2 through to TRL4 by March next year. Currently, we're in a subsystem testing and demonstration phase, which we hope to complete by March next year. And that's currently on track. At the moment, the number of the characteristics of the engine are through a combination of observed features and analysis. And we also have a timeline of when we think that we'll be able to have demonstrated values for all of the characteristics of the engine, which is essentially by Q1 2014. At that point as well, we should have a full technology roadmap for deployment and be embarking on our first integration mule demonstration. I'll now give you a sort of indication of what some of the likely characteristics of the engine will be. One of the most important is what the fuel consumption or the energy density of the fuel, depending on how you want to look at it, might be. The maximum availability from a kilogram of liquid nitrogen is about 200 watt hours a kilogram. This is what you'd get if you heated your kilogram of liquid nitrogen up to ambient temperature and didn't allow it to expand, and then expanded it from 3,000 bar all the way down to zero in an isothermal process. The isothermal process is much more efficient than, for example, an adiabatic process, which is one of the advantages of the Diemen engine compared to other attempts to commercialize this technology from history. And also that 
there's an isochoric pressurization process that takes place because the high pressure is only inside the cylinder, so you avoid some of the pumping work penalty of achieving relatively high cylinder pressures. Practically, we anticipate that the engine will operate between somewhere like 200 and 300 bar, as this is likely to be feasible given that the engine operates at ambient temperature. We also know something about the power density of the system, that based on operating between 1,000 and 2,000 RPM, that the engine is likely to have a power density of about 10 and 30 kilowatts a litre, which is about the same as industrial diesels. There's also scope to trade efficiency and power generation, power and power density. And you do that by essentially stuffing more liquid nitrogen into your engine cylinder and expanding it less efficiently. And it's possible to achieve, temporarily at least, high power densities between 60 and 80 kilowatts a litre, for example, for a period of heavy acceleration. Even though that the engine is not currently being sold, as it's only a TRL2 technology, that we do have a reasonable handle on what the cost might look like going forward, as essentially there's a large number of parallels between this technology, which is a simple reciprocating engine, and automotive technologies. That based on an analogous cost model, we believe that the engine is going to cost something like 60 to 100 pounds a kilowatt for the powertrain component in relatively low volume applications. And we know that the energy storage component, which is your tank of liquid nitrogen, is likely to cost about 50 pounds a kilowatt hour in very small volumes. Going forward, we expect to be able to improve on these prices through volume production and also through varying some of the engine materials and simplifying the system compared to automotive technologies because you can eliminate a certain amount of complexity with this system. In terms of applications, the most obvious application is as a zero emission prime mover, so it's something that potentially competes with battery and fuel cells, though we don't necessarily view this as the first market. And essentially, we think that technology will compete in this market because of the fact that it looks a lot like an internal combustion engine in terms of its cost profile. It also benefits from a fast refueling time and probably has maintenance requirements that are comparable to other IT engine technologies. And the manufacturing techniques you need to build this engine are probably pretty similar. The engine is also likely to be extremely tolerant of harsh environments and has spark-free operation, which is important particularly important, for example, to mining applications. The nearer term opportunity, we believe, is likely to be in waste heat to power. So instead of taking heat from the ambient environment, you take it from a waste heat source, for example, an IC engine radiator or exhaust system. Because of a very low starting temperature to our process, which is about minus 190 degrees Celsius, even low-grade heat can be harnessed relatively efficiently. So in theory, you could potentially take all of the heat from an IC engine, both the radiator and exhaust components, and convert it into additional work. And so that gives us an opportunity, potentially, for internal combustion engine hybrids, which we think will be potentially attractive in the light truck and bus markets, but also in other off-highway markets. The benefits of having this sort of hybrid are you reduce your hydrocarbon fuel consumption and your tailpipe emissions. You could also potentially downsize your IC engine and there's some synergies with other onboard processes, most obviously like air conditioning or refrigeration. And you also, looking at the longer term, could potentially eliminate some of the heat rejection equipment on board vehicles. You also have the opportunity to enable other emission saving technologies like start-stop by using the engine as a kind of auxiliary power device to, cap to support hotel loads. And in the very long term, that we could be looking at some quite close IC engine integration concepts where you potentially use the engine as a form of turbo boosting for the engine, for the IC engine. In terms of our commercial activity at the moment, we're in discussions with a number of end users, OEMs and industrial gas companies. Our objective is really to start putting together consortia so that we can investigate some of these applications and opportunities. In January next year, we're looking for partners for IDP8 and also that there's the IMEC -E liquid air working group work which is going on over the winter of this year and they're constantly looking for people who will participate in looking at the transport opportunities of this as well as the broader grid opportunities. Over the course of the next year we're looking for partners to walk alongside us and to carry on analyzing applications so that we're in a position to commence field trials during Q1 of 2014. Thank you very much for your time. If you'd like to get in touch with us you can get hold of us at info at dimandengine.com 
or give us a call on 0208-144-2989. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, we now have uh, a chance to um, pose your questions to, to, to Michael. Um, And just to uh, remind you, um, uh, if you haven't already posted a question, please feel free to do so now using the control panel on your screen or by raising your hand electronically. Uh, and a quick reminder that if you are using your phone, please ensure that you've entered your audio pin on your phone number pad. Um, so um, that was a fascinating uh, uh, presentation of, of, of the technology and, and something that I must say is, is, is new to me. Um, while we're waiting for um, uh, the audience to, to uh, pose their question, um, perhaps uh, I could uh, ask a question, into, uh, and that is about um, uh, how you see the, the infrastructure to support um, uh, uh, these, these, uh, these vehicles uh, working um, in the, the different applications that, uh, that you uh, uh, envisage. Thanks, Jonathan. I, there's a lot of infrastructure in place already, and so we, we plan to use that existing infrastructure to support the early applications. The figure I showed at the start of the presentation of having a 20,000 ton a day production capability in the UK, that, that very broadly equates to about 20 million vehicle kilometers. And so you can deploy quite a lot of this technology before you need to start putting down new infrastructure. Okay. Um. We still that's, that's, and and in terms of that 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 distribution process, um, is that through um, uh, 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 bottled gas effectively, or how how would that distribution process work? So at the moment, the process works at a number of different levels. Uh, for very large bulk users, liquid nitrogen is distributed through pipelines. Uh, it also is distributed through road tankers, much like gasoline. Right. And then the, those road tankers fill up vessels on client sites. And that those vessels are anything from maybe 10,000 litres all the way down to 10 or 20. Right. Right. Okay. Um, we have a, a, a question now from uh, Mark Matchett. Um, so, uh, Mark, would you like to pose your question? Hello, Mark. Okay, Mark. We uh, we can't. I'm sorry, Mark. Uh, oh, it's a really bad line. I, I can't quite hear you, Mark. Perhaps if you could um, post your question in the uh, questions tab, um, uh, then I could pose your question for you. Okay. Um, in the meantime, while, while uh, Mark is, uh, is typing his question, we have another question that's come in from uh, John Barton. So, um, John, can I turn to you? John. Hello, John. Would you like to ask your question? Okay, we can't hear John, but he has posted a question, so let me relay that. Um, he asks, uh, what about the boil-off while a car is parked? How much might boil off from a typical car-sized tank? This is a good question. There, there's some trades to be made around that. It's possible to get boil-off as low as 0.1% um, of the total tank volume a day. And um, vessels that are on to at the moment range from that 0.1% per day to about 1% per day boil-off. Okay, so fairly fairly limited. It's you know from that perspective, it's you know I um if in in a in a highly utilised application that that doesn't sound like it'd be a a a, material, a significant loss. No, I I would agree with that. There's also um, technologies available to deal with some of the issues like what happens if you leave your car at the airport for two weeks while you go on holiday. That there's Companies like Chart that are solving this problem for LNG that's used for powering trucks, and that they have um, vessels that have sort of three-week periods with no boil-off and things like that. Right. But there's okay. a cost to that, and so that there's some trades to be made in terms of how much boil-off you'll accept versus okay. how much cost that you're going to make into the system. 
Okay, Mark uh, Matchett's now um, been able to type in his, his questions. Let me uh, relay that uh, question to you. Um, and uh, um, he's asking about the carbon footprint uh, of this engine compared to diesel, uh, when you also take into account uh, the energy consumption uh, to liquefy the nitrogen. Yeah, okay. Now in terms of the well-to-well -well efficiency of the system, it's about comparable to hydrogen if produced through electrolysis. Now, one of the way in which that we're looking at deploying this technology in the future is as a low-carbon technology relying on low-carbon electricity. And the liquefaction plants are, are pretty well suited to pairing with renewable electricity. They're already connected to the electricity grid, so that the primary means of producing liquid nitrogen is through electricity, and that they're turned on and off in response to instructions from national grid or demand or price spikes. And so you have that flexibility to turn them on and off. So integrating them with the renewables fleet in the UK doesn't seem like something that requires new infrastructure. It's a change in operating regime. All right. Okay. Um, we have now a question from uh, uh, Rachel Brown. Uh, she's also noted that she doesn't have uh, a microphone, so I won't try and ask her uh, a question to, to relay the question, but uh, pose it directly. Um, and she asks, what kind of exhaust temperatures do you predict? Uh, the test engines we ran, we've run to date typically have only a 5 to 10 degrees Celsius temperature drop from ambient. So obviously that you have some flexibility with that because it depends on how much heat exchange fluid you want to put into the system. So if you wanted a very cold exhaust for some reason, then you'd be able to achieve that. Right. But, um, but otherwise, there's, there's no, um, uh, obviously, we're a 5% uh, five, uh, degree uh, reduction in from ambient. It's, it's not a, a, in any way a safety hazard, put it that way, or, or, or something that needs to be, uh, to be dealt with. No. No, and the other thing I suppose to add, Jonathan, is that the only low temperature parts of the system are the cryogenic tank and the cryogenic injectors. The engine itself is running pretty much at ambient temperature. Mark Matchett has, uh, has come back with a, a follow-up question, which uh, again I'll, I'll, I'll relay because he is, uh, he's not able to, to ask it himself. Uh, and his question is, uh, what sort of power output will the demonstration engine have and how scalable is this? The, the demonstration engine is likely to be single cylinder in the sort of 5 to 10 kilowatt range. And we think that that is probably a good starting point for some of the applications we're looking at for the auxiliary engine as when you move to multi-cylinder. In terms of the scalability of the engine overall, there's no real reason why it shouldn't scale a bit like diesel engine technology. And so you can get diesel engines for generators that are up to sort of, you know, a few megawatts. And that's the sort of scale that we can imagine going up to. We probably wouldn't go much below about one or two kilowatts. Right. Okay. Well, I think that um, uh, hopefully that answers um, the, the questions we have. We have no further questions coming forward. I, I have to say that you know what I find uh, particularly uh, intriguing about this kind of technology is it's another one of those technologies that introduces a different energy vector, um, which allows us to sort of uh, separate you know the, what the um, the energy source is to to what it's going to be used for, and you know, and, and using that as a uh, nitrogen as a, a liquid nitrogen as, a, as a, an energy vector. Uh, again, as you said, it's primarily produced from electricity and, and air. Um, that gives you the flexibility to say, okay, we can we can change the uh, um, the generating stock and the, the feedstock to that generating stock to uh, uh, to to our, yeah, and there's options that come out of that in terms of you know, uh, managing the overall electricity uh, uh, network. Which, are, which is what I find really exciting. Um, okay, we have one well, quick follow-up question from Mark Matchett, which I'll pose quickly and it'll be the last question before we, we move on. He asked quickly, uh, what sort of nitrogen consumption would you say a, a 250 kilowatt engine would have per hour? I don't know if you're able to uh, answer it would be quite a material on consumption. The a good rule of thumb is you need about 8 to 10 kilograms of liquid nitrogen per kilowatt hour out. So you'd be looking at something like 2,000 kilograms to 2,500 kilograms for your 250 kilowatt engine. 
Right. Okay. Well, um, just to reiterate, um, uh, Michael um, and, and Deerman Engine Company are, are, are members of uh, Low CVP, and there's a lot of interesting, very detailed questions coming up there. Um, contact details are available uh, from the uh, Low Carbon Vehicle Partnerships website um, to to put you in contact if you have any follow-up questions uh, that you'd like to to uh, ask as a result of what's been a very uh, interesting uh, presentation. So, to Michael, for the moment, thank you very much. Um, we now pass to our second uh, presentation, and um, we turn to David Price. Uh, Chief Technical uh, uh, Officer at Pi Innovo to present the work of uh, his company. Uh, so, David, over over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so, I'd like to uh, present the work that we're doing at Pi Innovo, and uh, in particularly our Open ECU concept. Um, so, first off, a little bit of background. Uh, Pi Innovo, who are we? Um, so we're an electronics and controls company based over near Cambridge, uh, and we also have uh, an office in Detroit. Um, we're a, a small business, about 45 people in Cambridge and similar numbers in Detroit. We have a, a fairly long history of electronic controls um, for automotive and related areas, going back uh, 25, 30 years. Uh, and originally starting with uh, engine controls uh, for emissions reasons for Detroit diesel trucks, and we've grown out of a, a racing business uh, back then. Uh, so over the last 20 years, we've worked on uh, a wide variety of electronics and control systems, from infotainment to safety-related systems. During that time, we developed the idea of open ECU as a, a concept of field-ready electronics. Um, it grew out of internal projects the um, best part of 10 years ago um, that has continually expanded now with new members of the family as technologies have moved on, and in particular new control strategies that we have available that make the product much more useful um, and ready to use out of the box. As part of uh, the application to the automotive market, we have the electronics manufacturing partners who are all have full automotive accreditation, so we can build units uh, and scale them from uh, one to uh, hundreds of thousands. And, and that's the key to the, the concept. So if I look at what's included in OpenECU, um, we have some custom designed electronic hardware modules. Uh, we have a set of platform software. Um, we have a variety of strategies for engine controls, exhaust after treatment, uh, some OBD infrastructure, which is the, the newest piece, and that's what I'll concentrate on in a moment. Uh, and then we have some additional configurable um, electronic hardware and off-the-shelf modules so we can make the system very flexible. So as I mentioned, the, the key to the system is how to get across the uh, valley of death, as it's sometimes called, when you go from a prototype that you've developed as your one-off through to uh, fleets and then hopefully into volume manufacture. So for our world of electronics and controls, the way we've approached this is to develop standard uh, but flexible electronic hardware which is built robustly um, so that the units that you use in prototyping are manufactured on the same lines as a volume product and they are suitable to go into uh, production in low volumes. So uh, as we look at this graph and think about the key things are time to get to production and then the cost per unit. If you need to be in production in small volumes very quickly, you can pick up standard electronics hardware manufactured 
uh, or from stock uh, and use it straight away. It certainly won't be optimized in terms of cost per unit. And that's where the design comes in that allows a flexible approach to customize some parts or all of the, the unit. So we have examples where we've used effectively stock products um, for small volumes, uh, some tailoring of uh, units for maybe a thousand off volume, and we even have one customer that's reworked the design completely to tailor it for them and uh, is in production now at 30,000 a year. So I'll now look at some of the tools and the approach that we've taken here is wherever possible to use industry standard tools and not to try and develop too many of our own. Um, so we use uh, MATLAB and Simulink as the control system design tools uh, and their uh, auto code generation um, which produces software which is then compiled with our open ECU block set so that's all the platform software and it goes into the controller so the idea is that you are working from uh, the control diagram so your simulate models of how you want the system to behave and then you don't need to worry about the details of what goes on inside the electronics um, you uh, drag and drop and build the system which then automatically at, at one key uh, produces a, a, an operating set of software in the hardware that's ready to try out on the vehicle. So I shall uh, show you a couple of examples now of uh, items where we've used OpenECU uh, and these have been picked for the topic of uh, the low carbon vehicles. So one example is Morgan Life Car where uh, OpenECU was used as a vehicle system controller, taking the driver's torque demands and integrating uh, the communications through to the other modules uh, on the system. Second example where we did similar things as a company based in South Africa, that's Optimal Energy, and they developed the dual vehicle uh, and again used OpenECU as the supervisor controls on that vehicle. Third example is uh, Ford fuel cell hybrid. Now this was uh, some time ago and this is where some of the open ECU concepts were built from. So this is some of our origins. Uh, and here there were three controllers used, all very similar all, and provided as that the idea of the open flexible controller. Um, they were looking after, again, the supervisor for the torque control and torque production um, the energy management controller and also a thermal system controller. And the, the fourth example that I've put up here uh, is a demonstrator where we worked with Myra and used OpenECU to control the petrol engine in the petrol electric hybrid. Uh, and the petrol engine was completely remapped to run much more efficiently. Uh, because it's not doing the same job that it was in the original vehicle. And so we were able to produce a, a vehicle with 20% uh, uh, fuel economy savings. So if I move on to a, a current project, um, this is a, a, an electric Land Rover. Uh, so you can see the concept from the vehicle there. Uh, it was originally started in South Africa as the idea of a big game viewer. And the, the concept was to take a, an existing Land Rover product, add the battery inverter and the other systems, and produce a demonstration vehicle very quickly. So we managed to do that uh, in six months uh, from concept to launch. And again, OpenECU has been used in there as the vehicle supervisor. So the control strategies were developed to include all the startup and shutdown, uh, all the driver controls, uh, integration of uh, the torque demands, and uh, 
how that's applied uh, and demands that are made of the traction motors and management of uh, any diagnostic faults, limp home functions, uh, and the reporting of battery state of charge through uh, other controllers and back to the driver uh, through the instrument pack. So a couple of reasons uh, why Pi Innovo was chosen as that particular supplier. Um, and so this is actually an extract from a JLR presentation. Uh, the key here is how to flexibly combine all of these other standard products onto the vehicle. And that's where OpenECU fits in very well as a flexible controller, uh, robust enough to work in harsh environments from day one, and yet able to manage and communicate and control all the other systems on the vehicle. Some of the other things that we have is the uh, strategies that we provide with the basic OpenECU uh, controllers. And these are uh, control strategies, and the idea is that they work out of the box on day one and allow you to concentrate on your own specific problems. So here we have things like standard engine controls, so diesel and gasoline uh, engine controls, which are uh, perfectly adequate, and if you're developing something extra for the engine, maybe downsize boosting, that sort of thing, then you don't want to worry about the rest of the control system. You want to pick that up and then get on with your own specific topics. And then the same goes for the after treatment models. And the most recent addition is the onboard diagnostics. So I'm going to spend a couple of moments talking about how we've implemented that and what it does for you. So onboard diagnostics is uh, something that, um, excuse me for the presentation, is using our iceberg model. There's a, a lot of um, strategy work that, that needs to be taken care of to diagnose the fault, and then a great deal of managing of the infrastructure underneath and the handling of those faults. So we can see here that underneath the iceberg um, there are, on a typical vehicle, many hundreds of faults that need to be managed and the data that needs to be managed. So every time the, the vehicle drives, completes a, a warm-up cycle or a drive cycle or a fault appears or goes away or a test is completed and new data is available, there's a lot of um, infrastructure that needs to handle and manipulate that data and then provide it in standard communications um, out to the scan tools from dealer services. And so in some of the numbers here we have uh, earlier vehicles with maybe 60 to 150 individual fault codes and hybrid vehicles uh, expected to have anything up to a thousand fault codes and pieces of data that all need to be managed and handled and presented in standardized fashion uh, through to the service tools. So that's uh, another example of the infrastructure that we provide with the tools that allows you to concentrate on the development of your own system. So the key overall is that flexibility uh, and how the open ECU can be tailored to suit whatever you need to control. Uh, and so we're using the example here of vehicle supervisors again, where there are existing um, subsystems for energy storage, um, driveline controls, charging. Uh, and torque controls, and they need to be integrated together and tailored for your specific vehicle. 
and OpenECU is an ideal tool for managing those different pieces and integrating them uh, and providing enough flexibility to fill the gaps and build the new vehicle control system. So, uh, thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, in, in summary, at uh, PyInovo, uh, we have the engineering and uh, OpenECU uh, as a control systems to take on all the challenges uh, of low carbon vehicles. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, again, a fascinating uh, uh, presentation. Um, and what a, um, an innovative approach to bridging that, that value of death uh, through, uh, uh, you know, through the application of a, a, a very flexible technology. Um, so, um, again, if you haven't posted uh, your question, please feel free to do so now using the, the control panel or raising your hand electronically. Um, we, while uh, people are, are, are looking at um, uh, are asking uh, or posing a, a question, um, in, in terms of um, you obviously have some some applications there that you've already um, you know, use this technology to to, to towards. Um, is there is there a degree to which you can sort of um, um, sort of looking back at that uh, um, that um, approach to bridging the the, the, the value of death? Uh, is is this being a, a successful approach to you? And, and what success has the sort of the open ECU? Uh, offered you uh, 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 so far, you know, as, as a potential sort of uh, 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 well, a product in its own right, beyond just just being a, a, a an approach to, to tackling a particular problem. Uh, yeah, so it started out as a, a tool to solve a problem that we had, which was uh, a prototype vehicle uh, developing as a, a one-off to trial systems. Uh, and then we recognized that any successful trial of an individual is inevitably going to lead on to larger fleet trials and gradually build up through to hopefully a volume production. Uh, and we recognize that it's very difficult to go from, say, a laboratory prototype through to something that needs to be made robust in the vehicle uh, and then through to fleet trials without having to completely re-engineer and move away from maybe a laboratory test system, rebuild it again for a vehicle control system. Uh, and so that's where we recognized that we needed to get across that valley of death. Uh, and so we, we started using um, electronic controllers that were not really ideal for particular jobs, but they were general purpose enough and started with engine controls. So we borrowed other people's hardware to start with before designing our own. Uh, and this is where we recognized that anybody's hardware that's designed for volume production has already been tailored and designed to get the cost out and do exactly that one specific job. But we wanted yeah. to be flexible, so we deliberately went back down the design path a bit and allowed uh, for flexibility, so we left things on the PCBs that wouldn't normally be there. We left flexibility in. Uh, we allowed space for Delta cards, all, all those kind of extra pieces, uh, and then produced that in a robust fashion so that that can be used now as your prototype and as your fleet trial unit, and then you can tailor from there for the volume production should that arise. Yeah, fascinating approach and a, uh, um, um, uh, obviously a very, a very flexible one. Um, does the the approach offer any? Um, I mean, I, mean, um, I suppose it, you know anybody looking to design or, or build this into a a, a prototype uh, vehicle component system um, is going to be looking at, at compromises. 
um, whether they're taking a a, a, you know, a, a mass-produced unit from somewhere else and, and applying it to them, or um, um, does it is, is there more of a compromise from this approach, or you know, or is it actually sort of opening up more flexibility? So, so if in, in a sense, sort of um, reducing the, the the degree of compromise for for those early stages of development. It, inevitably, it's a balance, and that's where we've tried to fit the balance. So, in building a new control system for for whatever it is on the vehicle, um, as your prototyping choice. Um, you've generally got a couple of uh, ways to go. You can pick up really flexible, very capable laboratory grade systems uh, that are expensive, but you can do just about anything with them. Uh, on the other hand, you don't really want to take them out cold testing and uh, leave them in vehicles at minus 40 degrees overnight. Yeah. Um, so that, that's one extreme. The other extreme is, is picking up a, an existing high volume product and then having to compromise your own system to use the capabilities that are in that. Uh, and so, so it's, we've tried to fit ours somewhere in the middle and provide a reasonable degree of flexibility, but at the same time having the robustness and the ability to go forward and do most jobs for most people most of the time. So is this the, the, the in a sense, the, 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 the finished article or the product offering um, uh, in, in its, its own right, or you know, are, are you, you know, what's the next step for, um, for, for Pi Innovo with this, this technology? Uh, so there are always um, changes taking place in the electronics world, uh, particularly communications. And so one of the next things that we're looking to do is try and integrate the control systems where you have to worry about safety um, because you're dealing with vehicles uh, and integrate those perhaps with the consumer electronics and uh, integrate them maybe with your smartphone, with uh, servers and networks so that you can then start and allow uh, some of the integrated vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications, vehicle-to-infrastructure and that kind of thing. So we're, that's kind of our next area to look at and work out how do we provide that again in a flexible yet robust manner. Yeah, this, I mean this area is a, is a very exciting one you know, and the the opportunities out there are almost uh, uh, limitless when you uh, sort of talk about integrating uh, electronic systems with the uh, with the ITS systems and and the opportunities that that, uh, that holds. So uh, a really exciting area, I, I should imagine. Uh, yes, but it's uh, fiercely competitive as always. Indeed, indeed. Okay, well, um, we we have uh, the panel seems to have been completely uh, satisfied by uh, by your presentation, which I thought was 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 excellent. Um, so I think unless uh, um, we have uh, any final questions uh, that people would like to, to, to pose uh, to David, um, I'd like to say thank you very much, David, for, for your, your presentation. Uh, before we wrap up, um, a, a quick word um, to raise to people's uh, attention, a quick reminder that the, the Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership are currently inviting entries for the Low Carbon Champions Awards. Uh, these awards are designed to identify and promote examples of outstanding and innovative practice in accelerating the shift to low carbon vehicles and fuels and reducing uh, road transport emissions. The 2012 awards will be presented as part of an evening celebration uh, for Low CVP's 10th anniversary, which will be held at the Institution of Mechanical Engineers on Tuesday, the 29th of January. Um, there are categories amongst the awards for vehicle manufacturers, fuel initiatives, fleet operators, transport initiatives, publications, research, uh, and innovation by SMEs. So plenty of scope there, and, and I certainly would hope that our, our two presenters uh, today will be uh, uh, be making their entries, and there will be uh, certainly worthy entries if they if they do put their names forward. Uh, for full details of the event and the awards and how to enter, please visit the Low CVP website. So, um, I think finally then, 
Um, I'd like to thank our presenters, uh, Michael Ayres of Dearman Engine Company Limited and David Price of Pi Innovo for two excellent presentations. Um, and to you, the audience, for taking the time to participate. I hope you found it useful. Uh, please remember the webinar can be downloaded from the Low CVP website. Uh, there you'll also be able to get details of future webinars um, uh, in the uh, Technology uh, Byte series. Um, if you have any questions, further questions relating to the presentations today, please feel free to contact Low CVP and we will put you in contact with our presenters today. Um, their details are also available from the Low CVP website. Uh, and with that, um, I'd like to thank our presenters and our panelists um, and you, the audience, uh, for uh, attending today. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>